Hello! Welcome to another episode of Ancient Office Hours by the Ozymandias Project. Trireme Transit is now boarding for all new and returning passengers. Now departing, present ponderings. Next stop is Ancient Office Hours at a library lost in the sands of time. Hey everyone, and welcome to episode 29 of Ancient Office Hours. My guest this week is Dr. Kathleen Lynch, a professor of classical archaeology at the University of Cincinnati. I'm so happy to have had this conversation because truthfully, I wasn't very familiar with her work before we spoke. I randomly stumbled upon a YouTube reaction video to Assassin's Creed Odyssey that she'd done for the Cincinnati Art Museum last spring, and I loved it so much that I immediately reached out to her. Luckily, we were able to sync up our schedules and ended up having an incredibly interesting and lively conversation about building and maintaining good relationships in and outside the field of classics, methods of finding a good dissertation topic, Harry Potter as the ideal Greek mythological hero, and how archaeogaming transforms STEM into STEAM. For any Greek pottery fans out there wondering, I did try to ask Dr. Lynch whether she preferred red figure or black figure pottery, but that question ended up being akin to asking her to pick a favorite child. So, in short, she couldn't choose, and so I didn't include any discussion about it. Sorry! This conversation is jam-packed with other amazing topics that will definitely get you thinking. So enjoy it, and I'll speak to you all soon. Hello, and thank you for joining me this morning, nice and early. Just to start us off, how did you get into classics? Because it's the big, wide-ranging question, and everyone's path is so different, so I do love hearing how everyone came to this thing that we all love so much? Well, I am a first generation college student and I am probably, I mean, I think in my family would say I'm probably also a first generation smart person in the family. And so when they saw that I was clever and, and smart as a young person, they pushed me towards medicine, pre-med, because that's what smart people did. Smart people go to med school. And I just followed that path all the way to college where I was a pre-med major. But I had always been interested in archaeology. I had always found it fascinating. You can imagine those curricula, your, your uh, requirements as a pre-med major are really very restrictive. You have only very, very few electives. So I took some an archaeology class, a Greek archaeology class as an elective, and I could not believe the intellectual satisfaction of it. It just blew my mind because in all of those other classes, now mind you, these are introductory level chemistry and biology and physics classes. It was just about memorization. And the way that you did well in those classes is an old exam would literally be taped to the office of biology, the wall, and you would go and you would study the old exams. And that's how you did well in the class is by knowledge of previous exams. So it really wasn't testing anything. And I was unhappy, but I didn't understand why I was unhappy. When I got into that archaeology class, not only was it the first time I had ever used my brain in a creatively creative and challenging way, but the faculty members were so excited to have us in those classes, which was also in contrast to my bio biology and <laughs> chemistry classes where the faculty were like, oh God, I got to teach this class. I'd rather be in the lab doing something that's meaningful to me. So they were very clear that they did not enjoy those, the, that time with us. So this combination lit within me something that was latent and I didn't even know it. I was hesitant because of course I didn't know. I had no, no one to guide me. I, had, I knew nothing, I knew nothing. I had had Latin because that's again what smart kids did is that they took Latin. I uh, graduated with a biology degree, with an undergraduate degree in biology. But the year that I graduated, I was able to go abroad. I went on a study abroad trip to Greece and Turkey. It was a very, in retrospect, it was very long. It was, it was six weeks, which is long, uh, which is long for a, a study abroad trip. 
And it was amazing. And it confirmed to me that that's what I wanted to do because of this personal connection and being able to see these places that I had studied. Um, what intrigued me from the beginning, I've been, always been interested in ceramics and pottery. And even when I was in those elective courses, I was asking the question, but, but how were they used? Like who, who was using them and why, why, how were they? And you know, oh, well, it's a pouring vessel. No, no, like, like in what social context were they used? And that was something that at the time was not very well explored and not a primary area of scholarship. So that's how I found the niche inside. But of course I did not have Greek. I did not have ancient Greek. So I did the Cooney Greek program I took a couple years off between undergraduate and graduate. I did the Cooney Greek program for which I am internally, eternally grateful. They are saints to do that. And they managed to bring me up to a level in one summer that I could do Thucydides in the fall. My first legitimate Greek class was Thucydides. <laughs> so God bless them. They did a good job. Um, so that's, that's how I, and then took a couple years off. I worked a normal job, hated it. It proved to me that I was not cut out for a nine to five kind of existence where I didn't have any personal involvement in what I was doing. And then I applied to graduate schools and uh, University of Virginia took a chance on me. I, I, I mean, I think back, I don't know why they accepted me. Um, I surely wouldn't be accepted now because my pathway was so unconventional, but they took a chance on me and it turned out to be just the right environment because it gave me a lot of freedom to do what I wanted to do. I didn't know, I didn't know anything. I didn't have any kind of guidance. So I kind of floundered around and luckily floundered in a positive way. <laughs> <laughs> and found my way, floundered my way into some good situations. But really, it came down to, to good people. I was lucky to meet really, really good people. For example, at, I was at University of Virginia for my PhD. And in my very first year, no one had told me that my advisor or the person who would eventually advise my dissertation was the Mellon professor at the American Academy. He wasn't gonna be there for three years. No one told me this. So I show up and, and they say, oh, well, he's not gonna be there, but we'll have these replacements. And one of those replacements was Tom Carpenter, who is also a scholar of iconography and, and vase painting. And his, so my very first semester, I had a class with him and that, that interaction was profound. And he continues to be a very good friend. He um, has retired here to Cincinnati. So we see each other all the time. And he was the external reader of my dissertation. And then the other kind of fortuitous thing that happened to me was in graduate school. Again, I knew nothing. Um, one of my faculty, John Dobbins said, oh, you should go to the American School of Classical Studies at Athens. I did not know anything about this program. And I said, okay, sure. So I applied and I got a fellowship. Again, I have no idea how I got a fellowship. I don't think I would be competitive these days, but back then I was. And that relationship also became essential to my view of the field and my success in the field. And I met some wonderful people there that became really great mentors beyond my program, like outside my program. And then the, the, that, that model of mentorship is something that I try to emulate in my own relationships with grad, graduate students, because it was, it was more important to me than the coursework that I had back in Virginia, that kind of thing. So that's how, and so the American school also then uh, led me to other connections. There was a time when Mark Lawal was studying amphoras at the Agora. My, my, my dissertation was on Agora, Athenian Agora uh, pottery. And he said, the people at Troy need somebody to study the classical pottery. Would you be interested? And I said, sure, because I, was, I needed to expand beyond Greece. And so I went to Turkey to work with that project. And that was at the time being the, the post Bronze Age was being directed by Brian Rose, who was a faculty member at Cincinnati. And so in the course of my itinerant one year positions here and there, Cincinnati had an archaeology position open and I applied for it. 
I cannot tell you how lucky I am in so many ways, but the day when the search committee was reviewing the applications, I happened to be in Cincinnati for a Troy meeting, a Troy team meeting. We were, Brian brought us together here. I was in the library here in Cincinnati and Brian came down to me and he said, Kathleen, only one of your references is here. Uh, can you get me your other two references by two o'clock? We're meeting at two o'clock. I went to his office and I got on the phone and I called my referees and they faxed. That was back in the day of faxes. They faxed them in. Eventually I get the position, but I cannot believe the sequence of dominoes that had to fall for that to happen. And I know that's kind of fortune that you just can't make from bio major to professor of archaeology, professor of classics with a Greek archaeology. <laughs> that is one heck of a really fortuitous path yeah. that so many people would probably just be like, can I replicate that? You know, the one thing I can say, the piece of advice, I know a lot of this was just fortune, just total fortune. But the one thing I can give advice to is be nice to everyone, be kind to everyone, because you never know when those relationships will come back. And, um, you know, Brian Rose knew my work ethic. He had seen me working in the field. He knew I and my, my um, attitude. He knew all of that already. So that kind of gave me a leg up in some ways, I suppose. But I also was doing what they needed. That's, that's first and foremost. All of these relationships you form, you, they're two-way relationships. You're helping other people. They're helping you. So that's, that's the moral of the story is uh, always remember that this is no matter what a small field and relationships matter and mentoring don't don't hesitate to look for mentors beyond your program yeah i think that's really valuable advice and it's funny you should say that because it fits into pretty much the narrative in a lot of other fields as well um when I graduated a couple years ago with my BA and I knew I wasn't going to be going on into grad school and classics at least for the foreseeable future just until I figured things out I chose to go into politics as a career which may or may not be just a stupid decision depending on how you view going into politics I suppose but I thought it was all great fun and yeah the the first thing they tell you is politics seems like a big place it's not it's very small it's got a lot of parallels to classics which is something I don't think I I quite realized because the, of the way that we were either brought up or were taught about mm -hmm. the political system you just think of it as okay it's this big thing and you go in and there's so many people you're never gonna meet or have the chance to interact with so it doesn't matter what you say oh no 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 <laughs> That is not at all true. I learned on my feet. I did an internship in DC and that is the smallest of small places. Yeah, right. So I tell people treat classics departments, no matter how big or small they are, like you would treat Capitol Hill. Yeah. That's a great, that's a, that, that's great advice because we think we're so disconnected, but in, in fact, it is all very, very connected. And it, and that can be insidious, right? It can be really uh, suffocating but it can also be a really wonderful community and that's the aspect that you have to focus on yeah when people don't tend to believe me about this i i'll tell them straight up the the ways that things that you say can get around in the most ridiculous of situations you can't make this stuff up and now i'm sure it's very different in terms of what is said and how is said when you're dealing with classics departments and mm -hmm. politics but the example i i like to use just because it was it's so bonkers to me but it's so indicative of how these things go there was an intern who famously went to a nationals baseball game in dc with a friend who was also an intern but in a different office they just kind of had no concept of this is still dc where there's people so she proceeds to just harangue on how much she hates her boss how much she hates the office how much she hates all the co-workers and how miserable she is in her internship not realizing that one is she talking bad about her office but two she is gossiping about the boss's work and some of the portfolio and 
their opinions on certain issues. There was a reporter sitting right <gasps> behind her. Oh my and god! And she did not know this was a reporter, and it was for a pretty big outlet. And so they were kind of getting the dish on. Right. Oh, this member believes this, according to this person who has said many times how much she interns in this office. Wow! So it got to the reporter, and the reporter was friends with the chief of staff for that office. I mean, that's just like the worst luck of worst luck. But I mean, there's other horror stories about interns shit talk in their offices on the train in D.C. And yeah. someone's there, chief of staff or someone who's friends with people and it gets back. So I often thought, you know, what are the chances of something like that happening? Well, <laughs> apparently <laughs> a lot more often than you would think. So, yes, right. Right. relationships are are you should maintain them. Uh, you should be nice. Yeah. You should, even if you are unhappy, try to keep that unhappiness to yourself or right. limited to your own personal private space, a private phone call in your home, something where it just has no chance of leaking out. But polite and professional. I mean, you don't, there are people you're not going to like. I mean, that's just the reality of life, right? But finding a way to manage to work with them is really the key to a professional life. So yeah, I try to tell my graduate students this too, because you just never know. I mean, you're sitting around just the same thing as the ballpark. You're sitting around the Agora tea table. And if you start complaining about your program, it's going to get back. It's going to get back to the faculty and that's not good. You know, you, and, and if you're complaining, I know, I know there, that's sort of like the, the hobby where our hobby is whining and complaining. There's getting it off your chest and then there's being active, being active about it. And that's just, you know, don't just complain, act. It's also yeah, good advice. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So at any point, as you were making all these leaps, coming out with BA in biology probably fully helped with getting a job out in, in the world when you were working in the in-between? No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 it did not. It did not. I ended up my, my in-between college and graduate school work was, well, honestly, I was a Kelly temporary work. I did temp work. But I got a long-term position um, at the time I was, my husband was finishing at University of Pittsburgh. So we were living in Pittsburgh and I, that's where I was taking my, I was taking Greek and Latin intermed between. Uh, I was taking a class or two every semester just to keep going. But I was working with um, University of Pittsburgh facilities management. And so they're the people who oversee everything from the custodians to the construction on campus. And I was just doing mindless secretarial style work. It was one of the best things I've ever done because it showed me, I mean, remember, I'm a first generation college student. My family was very much blue collar and nine to five, you do it, you come home. I just could not see myself in that model of career. I don't know, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't even call it a career. It's just a job. And that was, that was helpful to me. It, I knew I needed more than just punching the clock. And so did this drive knowing early on that you, you this was just not going to cut it. So you need that really intellectual stimulation that you were craving that luckily classics was right there and you, you had sort of a, a goal to, to work toward. Yes. How did you deal with a lot of the, the doubt that inevitably seeps in? Because as <laughs> most people will know, if you come out and you're not you don't have that linear path where you're like, OK, I got the BA. So now I just go right into grad school because I have. The, mm -hmm. all the requirements did you just have some points where you would sit down and be like man this is I know I want to do this but it's really hard so I don't know or was there just no doubt that you were like no no no, I'm getting language and I'm, I'm going right on I was too naive to know about doubt at that stage I totally was I, I had done the study abroad program and I spent a lot of time talking to the instructors and they were very encouraging and they they did not give me any I mean they, they said you need to do Greek you need that was that was the kind of advice they gave me they did not discourage me at all but I just was too stupid to know and that's what I say like looking back on it I cannot believe I even got accepted to a program where the doubt hit me honestly the doubt really walloped me after I got my PhD and I spent those years moving from one position, temporary position to another. That's when I really hit bottom because even back then, this was 
in the early 2000s, even then the job market was not robust, but compared to now, it was like, you know, it was, it was a flourishing fire of jobs. Now, I mean, it's just a little trickle. That's when I had my doubts. Like, why did I do this? And, and here's, here's the first generation student mindset that really caused me to doubt myself was this idea that, well, I've done all of this schoolwork. I've got, I've got all of these degrees. Surely that is just opening a door to a job. It should just come naturally. The more degrees you have, the more jobs there should be for you. And that was really also very naive. And again, I think coming from, a, I didn't have any models to tell me that that's not necessarily true. I mean, that's, you need to, that's not how it works. It's not just like get a degree and, because you know, in the other fields it is, you know, like engineering, you know, there would have been a natural progression right out the door into a job. So that's where the doubt hit me. And I think the thing that kept me going is that I kept my research alive. That's what I've, I've seen a lot of people get stuck at that stage because those one-year positions, I mean, they beat you like a rented mule. They, they make you do so much work teaching new classes you've never taught before. Hell, I even taught non-Western art. I taught non-Western art. I'm a classicist. But as an archaeologist, context matters. So I was able to grab hold of context and teach myself what I needed to know. That's when the doubt came. Like, well, I did all of this. I've done all of this. And why isn't there something just being handed to me? But keeping my research alive, I kept a research profile. And that's what I've seen. A lot of people get stuck and they are snowed under by all the stuff they have to do. And so they don't keep their research alive. I continued to go to conferences. And again, those relationships that I made, I, I continued to work at the Troy Project even when I was in between undergraduate or, or graduate. And that's where it hit me. Yeah. And I think that there's something to be said for that mindset because I think it extends even to those of us who aren't first generation college students. I think I still naively sometimes think, well, if I go and get my PhD, then I'm opening so many doors and someone will have a job for me too. Right. Not the case at all. But sometimes I, I want to naively think it's okay. You know, the job market, it's, it was so hard getting my first job out of college. The first job I ended up getting was literally on a political campaign mm -hmm. because they need people fast. They right. need you as long as you can hold a conversation and talk to people and grasp complex issues. They're like, great, you're hired. And they know it's temporary because mm -hmm. you're going from whenever they hire you on to November. And then it's got like a clear end date. This whole world of campaigns that I just didn't know beforehand, it's completely the opposite from classics. It's instead of wait your turn uh, through a glacial market, wade through, move. I mean, it's, it's similar in that I say, if you're an early career scholar and you're jumping around from one year position to one year position and moving into like the remotest of places that you've never heard because they have something campaign work is kind of the same. You're moving to like a small place or a city that you've never been to, you know right. nothing about, but they oh, say, Hey, we'll pay you a lot of money really quickly mm -hmm. to come learn a, an entire new region, mm -hmm. learn about a candidate and just start being able to spout off exactly what their message is. So it's this learn faster die. The only difference is classics, they won't pay you a lot right up front. <laughs> No. <laughs> you're you're struggling there but you're still moving somewhere completely foreign to you and and you're you're doing so much so the only difference really between political campaigns and classics is cash out i guess but it's mm -hmm. it, it's shocking how much they're kind of that's the same fascinating i did not know that I, that's really a curious parallel yeah, so I think that's why when people ask me about my path and how, you know, did it relate to classics, I kind of just said, you know, it's it's really closer than you think and here's right. why. So if you're looking at something that you might be interested in if you're trying to because I also realize that while it's a lot of work and it's really busy and you know, campaign schedule is very rigorous, it does offer you the unique opportunity to study and do more if you want to do that uh -huh. so I could have totally like taken a language class at the same time yeah. because yes it's busy and yes it's kind of like annoying because then you have to do the oh well your weekends aren't your own because you're either canvassing or you're leading a phone bank event and you're working from whatever time in the morning to when the event is over but it's it, it's it's kind of almost like that 
nursing schedule I like to to mm. harangue my friend about, which is, oh, so you do a crap ton of work for like three days, but then right. you have two days or whatever to just like sleep and not work. Mm-hmm. Campaign is much the same, even to nursing in that regard, where I'm like, you'll be hit over the weekends with a crap ton of stuff but then you have like two days there where if you're lucky and and mind you this it's it cannot be anywhere near november but (laughs) up until that last month you have a lot of time where you can study and do personal work so interesting you you can you can learn greek you can do any of the languages to get yourself ready and Mm -hmm. you can make a a a nice little amount of money right on the side to make sure you can fund your your next step so uh, Mm -hmm. i always tell people if you're looking it doesn't appeal to everyone because the lifestyle is really crazy and it's it, it's mm-hmm. its own animal. But if you're looking for like a really fulfilling middle kind of job where you don't want to have that nine to five drive you crazy, mm-hmm. do just secretarial things, I say try to find a political campaign if you could stomach it. You know, it doesn't even need to be national. If you don't want to get into like a presidential year, that's fine. You don't even have to have like a senatorial, gubernatorial. I'm like local politics, it's you're still living the same life, but you can choose where in the entire country you want to move. So I'm like, if there is literally a classics program in some little town or some big city that you think you might want to work with a faculty member there, find a local campaign there because you can do all the work and then reach out to the professor and be like, hey, I'm living in the area. I'm working, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I have a lot of time to myself during the week. Can you meet up for coffee? Right. Like it is a fantastic opportunity How to network. I had and no idea. That's, I will remember this and I will suggest it to. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if, if we're just, you know, being practical about what can a classics yeah. major do that's useful in the interim. Right. And it's especially good if you are someone who loves ancient political thought right get sure. involved right, please. right there are so many parallels i had no idea i'd always liked ancient political thought but i was like eh, how much does it really have to do with modern stuff we're we're mm-hmm. evolved no 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 <laughs> there's so many things that are the same so i'm like yes that is my if, if that is the one takeaway i'm like my best advice is if you are a classicist and you want the what do I do in my year where I can make money and survive but not be miserable working at Target or something right political campaigns are for you they will pay you three thousand (laughs) dollars a month to just call people on the phone (laughs) and then let you have a bunch of time to study how that does not sound terrible to me but that's that's really great that's 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 just me well, on the other hand, I, uh, my experience was enough. To, I suppose it's your experience too. It's enough to tell me this is not what I want to do for my life. So I suppose you had the same reaction. Exactly. Cause I was like, Oh, this is great. I'm not doing this forever. Oh my gosh. This is, this is my, my very temporary. Right. I'm still finding my path and my career and, and what I want to do. So this is fine for, for now. It's a very for now thing. And then you can, <laughs> progress to doing other things but got that lucky jump and and then you got to go to to Greece and you found some projects I'm really interested to hear more about that because I did a study abroad kind of very similarly but I did mine between my freshman and sophomore years college and I went to Greece for five weeks and it was the most magical thing and that really cemented for me this is what I'm passionate about this is my thing I love this, but I didn't, you know, get on and any archaeological projects. I just kind of went and had a great time and came back and did my thing. So I think maybe the timing was different because for me, it was my after my senior year. And so it was it was a little bit more do or die. And but it was the same idea that you, what you just expressed that I went to, you know, if I'm really serious about this, this is this is a litmus test. If it if it goes well, this is a sign if I'm if I don't like it, if I'm bored, then this is also a sign that, I, that is this is not the path for me. The key was when I, so I went for a study abroad, they were encouraging, they didn't, they did not tell me the reality. So I, again, I'm blindly naive about what I'm doing. Then in graduate school, when 
my advisor, one of my advisors said, you should go to the American School of Classical Studies. That's, that was really, in terms of my career, the key is going to the American school because it is this research institution within Greece that is a node. Everybody comes through the American school, both Americans and, and all the, it, it's, it has the best library. So all of the researchers, Greek, German, Finnish. I got involved with the Finnish school. Uh, I even, my husband had a Fulbright in Finland. And when I was, when he was there, I went uh, and the kind people of the University of Helsinki took me in um, where they, they were writing a Corpus Visorum Antiquarum, which are these volumes of ancient vases by country. So they were preparing the Finland um, Corpus Visorum. And so I was able to help them. And then that person became the director of the Finnish Institute at Athens. So I, you know, those are the kinds of things that is like, you can't make this happen, but you can be open to it. Yeah. And so what, what did you always want to also expand beyond Greece, like into Turkey, or was this very much an opportunity that just arose and you uh -huh. kind of jumped at it because you were like, oh, well, this will just enhance my entire portfolio. Well, okay, so here's, uh, you know, I, I made a lot of good decisions that I didn't even know I was making. So one of the decisions that I made as because I was interested in pottery, and I was interested in figure decorated pottery, pottery with designs on it with figural designs on it. And the key producer of this is the Athenians, the Athenians are the key producers of this black figure and red figure. Well, it goes all over the Mediterranean. So the opportunity to go to Turkey was an opportunity to see what the export market looked like in, in Western Asia. And this has become a further element of my research portfolio. So I'm, I'm interested in not just, uh, I'm interested in the contrast of how this figure decorated pottery was used at home in Athens, which was my dissertation. And then my further career was, was the com comparison of um, the export market to the domestic market. So the good news is this pottery goes all over the place. So I, I've worked in Italy, I've worked in Sicily, I've worked in Albania, um, Turkey uh, on excavations. Or, well, you know, just, just to be clear, I don't excavate, I go in and tell them what they have. So I, I work on the pottery that has already been excavated. So anyway, this is, this is just another you know, correlate of the topic that I studied. I think there's this tendency to look at expanding into other regions as sort of, I don't think they see it as an offshoot of what they already do, because I talk to so many people now who are actively having conversations that sound very much like, well, you know, maybe I should add another region mm -hmm. or another topic mm -hmm. of interest because I want to make my portfolio good because if I just study this one thing, it's too narrow. It sounds just like you made amazing decisions I, that really paid off. You had no idea. I, <laughs> yeah. So finally, I mean, I, I, you're making me feel like I've been such a lucky person and I, don't, I, I feel guilty for taking it for granted. But, but, the, but that goes back to that initial question in, the, in that elective of course, the Greek archaeology course I was taking while I was a bio major, I kept asking who used this stuff? Who was actually holding this? What were they doing when they were using this? And the answer to that question goes, does actually go to the question of the difference between the domestic market and the export market, because it turns out that the Athenian potter, potters were creating pottery for the export market. So Everything you see in your textbook, if you open any Greek archaeology, you open any Greek mythology textbook, I guarantee you 98% of the Greek vases you see in there were not found in Greece. They were made in Greece, either by the Corinthians or the Athenians, but they were found outside of Greece. So that brings in this fabulous question of well, what, how are these functioning within a different culture? If they are made for Greek cultural activities, how do they, how does that transfer to a different culture? How are they adopting and adapting these things? So that's, that's, so, so the root of the question was back in that very first class I took, but then it's taken me a whole career <laughs> to try to explore it in different ways. <laughs> so I guess what you're saying is also, 
if you're lucky, you'll pick a really interesting topic that can take you very far yes. because there are definitely some topics like that, sure. which I might not have thought could branch so far. Mm -hmm. But if you do more research into it, then you realize, oh, yes, this, this has 100 percent right. everything to do with what I'm doing. And there's some and topics. I, and that I think the question. Like I think the point there is the kind of question you ask. And this is really important for, for dissertation. So I, as a, as a ceramic specialist, I have many, dis, many uh, graduate students writing PhDs using pottery. It's like, fine, that's fine. But what is the question you are asking? It, the pottery is just a means to answer that question. So what we really are trying to get to are the people of the past. And a lot of people are mute because the literary record only represents a slim portion of the population. But one way we can get down to that individual level is through ceramics because they survive and they are, pottery was only created to facilitate human activities. It only exists to, to, for, for humans. So therefore it reflects. So I, I try to get my students to say, yeah, I don't care about the, you know, the typology, the chronology, you know, the way we organize it is one thing but what's the question that gets us back to that human level um what can we learn about the people i think that's fantastic advice also i'm noticing you kind of luckily stumbled into doing things backwards again which is most students have an idea of, of the kinds of things they like i know i did i went in and i said well i like this thing and i like this thing not realizing, well, yeah, I'm talking about the materials that I like to see and look at. I didn't really have the question. And most, I would say, students I know, at least, mm -hmm. when they go into their advising appointments, they're always coming out and then telling me, oh, I was harangued about what what is the root of my interest in this, that, and the other thing. And I don't know how I'm going to craft that into my one dissertation question or my thesis question, help, help, help. You went, you went around it backwards, but but like in a really lucky way where... Mm -hmm it seems to me that it was pretty straightforward. You knew your question. You knew you want to ask why, how, where, what. And so all you had to do was really pick your medium. So right. to me, that seems like you, you kind of formed your dissertation question right there. So by mm -hmm. the time you were actually ready to do it, I'm ready, let's go pottery yeah. like this. And I think it was a, th that question was really a product of its time because at that point, you know, Greek archaeology classes, Roman archaeology classes were all the big monuments, all the big men. And so I, maybe I was ahead of my time a little bit, but asking these types of contextual questions and, and actual behavioral activity questions, that just, that level of presentation was not, uh, was not delivered in an undergraduate class. So, so that I was, I was, asking for things that weren't being discussed in class. And so I think that's another, that's another piece of advice is to look for those, those gaps, look for the gaps. It's like, why aren't we talking about this? What, is there a reason why we're not, maybe we can't do it, but, but are there topic, are there ways of asking questions? And that's, a, that's another thing I really believe in is asking new questions of old material. Archaeology is by nature destructive, and I, it, it makes me very, very anxious that we continue to dig and dig and dig, yet there's so much material that has not been studied or could be restudied with these new questions. That's a little bit of a uh, diversion, but it's, it's something that's very important. Yeah, I think it needs to be discussed and it needs to be asked, though, because I know a lot of people who kind of say all right well this is this is what we have so i'm just gonna take this and, and work off of it until somebody else tells me it's wrong mm -hmm. which is fine but i don't think uh, people realize but you could take this really popular thing that we talk about and study you could be the one to be like right. i don't think this is quite right let's let's go into this Absolutely. everyone wants to use that to do something else so it's really yeah, or something something new that 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 good research has to be something something that takes something unpublished and uh, uh, you know in our case like unpublished artifacts. No, you something you, bringing new questions to old material can be just as useful and vital to the field. For sure. And what I guess advice would you give? So, what advice would you give to someone who came to you and said? I don't know what I want to do for my dissertation. I don't know how to even start to find a way to form the question. I just like suits of armor. I don't know. Something right. random. Just something random, you know. So yeah. do you have 
advice for a certain process for finding that or is it got is it going to be just like a really individual thing where there it's definitely never going to be it's never it's not one size fits all but um i guess i'm trying to get it like is there like a formula maybe people can follow to help them find this question or it, does that rely completely on the individual who's coming? Well, I, I think I think the best, uh, most successful dissertations are ones that speak to you personally in some way. Um, and I think that's how our field has moved forward because we are all products of our time. So we're asking questions that are relevant to us now, but by, by way of uh, or through the, the lens of this ancient material. So individual is important. But when students come to me, it's a dialogue. It's kind of a Socratic dialogue <laughs> where you say, okay, so what are some of the things, what are some of the ideas or the, the concepts about the ancient world that interest you? So they say, well, I'm interested in warfare. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the, the dominance of war, warfare. It's, it's ever present and it's, it, it's, it's, it's society defining in the ancient world. Okay, what, what aspects? And, and so it's a, it's a, it's a dialogue. I, I ask these questions and then we develop it. And so for example, the person interested in armor, what we could come around to is the idea that why would you put armor it, why would you put armor into graves? What is it? What is, why does that happen? Because that's taking something out of circulation that is still functional. Maybe a dissertation about the deposition of personal armor. What is that saying about the person, about the importance of war in that society? So, so that's how I would do it. I would ask them to try to identify what the what concepts they're interested in and help them find a question, a dissertation question that touches on that. But nevertheless, that, that process is going to be individual because if you are interested in, I don't know, um, animals, that's going to bring you in a different direction. And you're going to have a dissertation about horses and burials, the, the, the sacrifice of horses. Why would you sacrifice a horse? It's a valuable thing. That's like putting your car into a, into a grave. Why would you do that? What does that mean? And so and that kind of thing, that's how I do it. Okay. So it sounds like it's this fun game of you kind of have to be like a, like a shrink and, yeah, right. and Socratic <laughs> method your way into how do you feel about this? And right, I, show, like the, I this? show them ink blots. I show them ink blots, and it's like, what do you see here? I see a Greek vase. I see. <laughs> that's a that's a great way you could have some elaborate sort of Hogwartian Professor right. Trelawney. Hat. Yeah, the sorting ball. hat. <laughs> And, and then you and then you sort of do the let's read the tea leaves. What does this lead you to today? What is the star chart that uh, you know have the stars aligned for you? If it were only so easy, but the, but the key is finding something that a person is really invested in, and that will naturally be something that that is is personally interesting to them. And I and as I said, I think that's really how we are moving the for, field forward because the questions and the topics that are interesting to us today are relevant because they're reflective of our times. So I, I try to encourage encourage that too. Yeah. And one thing I really kind of wanted to ask now that I've, I've heard more about how you approach helping people with their dissertations. Archaeology in and of itself is unique and fortuitous if that's your thing, because you, you're like, oh, well, then I love studying the material evidence that we have. It's great. You can go places and see mm -hmm. the things. What about the people who don't want to do archaeology? You know, mm -hmm. it's kind of like that. That's like a whole different thing if you want to be a philologist or, mm -hmm. or a linguist or something, then it's not so easy, right? Because you can't just say, okay, I want to go and I want to study these artifacts and, and be able to photograph them and look at them and look at the changes and right. a lot of the more observable things. And I think that's something when I was going through school that I really struggled with because people were always besieging me with the, what do you like? Well, what do you want to do? Mm -hmm. What objects artifacts do you like mm -hmm. and I was sitting here this poor undergrad like I don't know I right. just and and then I realized well I don't think archaeology would be for me because mm -hmm. I very much love nationalism and oh, okay. that's probably what drove me into modern politics because I loved political thought mm -hmm. and because I loved nationalism but it was so interesting just the, the nationalistic fervor within contained 
within individual palaces Mm -hmm. and the fact that Greece is one of these strange places in history where no it's not this one unified country it's not Egypt where everyone's conquered and then kumbaya and then they all just prosper Mm -hmm. together Mm -hmm. I'm like no these were people who you look at the neighbors from next door oh you're not citizens no you don't get these rights you don't get to do this we're better than you are I'm like why this Mm -hmm. is so ridiculous you might like they might have I don't know had a better time if there was just one overlord of Greece (laughs) I mean you know and then you can get into Alexander and well was were they better off because there there was this one head honcho and I'm like you know that's a great question no you know what you just hit on something that I I love this question would they have been better off if there was a federal level of uh, like in the archaic and classical period, we won't deal with the Hellenistic period because that's different. But these are the kinds of questions that I like to challenge my students to think about because you need to know how it was in order to imagine a different reality. And that is one I haven't. The questions I ask from time to time is if Pericles never lived, what would the Acropolis look like? So you have to know what all of the impact of this individual and the politics of the moment to to try to do that now that you said it I can't unthink that yeah now I'm going to be pondering that for at least the rest of today if not the rest of my life (laughs) what would the Acropolis look like without Pericles well well it's then it's really similar to a question that I challenge myself with probably daily already which was what would have happened in the Peloponnesian War if he hadn't died of plague if he'd lived a lot longer let's say he lives another 10 to 20 years what happened you know does he stop the Sicilian expedition does he say no that's stupid we're gonna lose don't do that this is a this is something that I've come to just lately, very lately, these kinds of questions that are hypothetical. But I think that that shows you shows us how classics is good to think with. It, there isn't an outcome. It doesn't matter what the outcome of this fabulous imaginary <laughs> discourse is, but it gets us to analyze material in new ways. I don't know. That's, I just think it's, and I think that students, especially undergraduates today, like this kind of imaginary question. Well, and it helps, I think, because for me, dealing both with classical material and then current politics, it's, it's this wonderful sort of thing where you're using the same muscles in your brain where you can think about these deeply meta questions right that are just really fun to theorize about or I find them fun to theorize about at least I know plenty of friends who this would not interest them at all which is totally okay but it's 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 a nice escape where I don't want to theorize about modern immigration programs. I mean, mm. I do because I'm interested in it deeply, but it's also deeply mm-hmm. upsetting to think about in the modern context. So mm. when I want to step back from that, but still use exercise that same muscle in my brain, right. you just right. you pick up any sort of classical question and say, OK, well, if I think about it in the ancient world, maybe I can find exactly. something satisfying. Exactly. So it's um. It's just another way of, as I always say it, looking at the world from the ancient perspective to help me understand the modern stuff is how I honestly connect with the material because I can't fathom or imagine not using the ancient world as as just sort of the prism with which I, I see everything today. Right. No, and this is, so this is, an, you're, you just mentioned immigration studies, and this is a really good example of how I said the questions people ask are deeply um, uh, important to them, and, and that's the most successful kind of research, and there is a wave of immigration studies in the ancient world right now, which is a very natural correlate to our current concerns about immigration. So even within um, uh, Danielle Kellogg is studying immigration within, even within Attica, like who, who moved from where to where, and then the Athenians beyond when they go out. So she's tracking them. And this is something like we, these are types of questions that are coming out of contemporary American discourse, but we can see from the past that people, humans are making similar decisions. Why are they moving? For economic benefit, because there's some threat where they're living. This is not so different. Opportunities are different. 
but the motivations can sometimes be very similar. And there's something satisfying about that, but also it also explains why the trends in our field are following the the path of contemporary topics as well. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because I do know I have met a couple people who prefer to keep the ancient world very yes. quote unquote alien. Right. And say I don't want to study them and observe them as us, but right. as a some completely separate entity. Mm-hmm. And I understand that, and I and like to a degree, I'm kind of like, well, I think we all kind of do that. But at the same time, I think the moment that you completely separate them from us you've lost it is kind of how I think of it because I'm like well but they aren't though like they are us we are them just living in a completely different time but we have all the same problems so if you start to really talk about how they're just so different could mm-hmm. never be us you you've lost me it is kind of how I see it but I I agree because I I think the human element the fact that we are all we are humans we experience things I I teach a big mythology class And my objective in the myth class is to get students to understand um, that ancient myth is still alive and relevant in our own times. And one of the things we do at the very end of the class is I have them do a little project using the theater of war, which is Brian Dory's, um, uh, uh, the original one, the original one, which was literally the theater of war, which uses the Ajax and the Philoctetes to talk about what we know as post-traumatic stress. The students, so amazing to see them realize that modern soldiers, modern American soldiers, can be helped by just the connections to the past. The idea that somebody 3,000 years ago suffered the same emotional experience, something that they are, they are so reticent to talk about in their own lives to the point of, of hurting their families and even committing suicide. Just learning that Sophocles challenged his audiences to recognize this pain 3,000 years ago, that's enough to open them up and for them to ask, for these modern soldiers to ask for help. This blows the students' minds. And I think that's the best example of how the past and the present connect. And the bottom, the con- common denominator is this emotional experience. And I try to explain to the students in myth that the Greeks were the first to really embody their storytelling with human emotions with with human experience and emotions and that was part of that catharsis that that um, Aristotle talks about that theater is a cleansing because you vicariously consider these things they're not happening to you but you recognize them and you can process them through the 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 spectator spectating and so I try to incorporate things like that I don't mean to say that the ancient world is that I don't want to make direct connections but this kind of meaningful connection I think that's what stays with students from a class like myth when they leave. I would agree. And I I would say Greek mythology in particular also stands out when you hold it up to other mythologies. When I first learned about the ancient world and got into ancient studies, it was not classics. It was actually Egyptology in sixth grade. It was something about their mythology. But at the same time, Egyptian mythology is so bonkers right all these anthropomorphic gods and wait 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 this one has a a baboon head wait excuse me say that again Mm -hmm. and you know a a cat goddess wait like half half woman half cat or is this just like a cat it's that kind of bonkers thing that also is prevalent in Norse mythology because Mm -hmm. I I was never on the Norse train until later in life until probably a year ago when I really started to read in when the pandemic hit and I was like okay well I've never really been big into Norse myth let's get into it let's try it and I realized I mean a lot of it is really similar themes but also it's quite bonkers and there's something about the relatability of Greek mythology where they tie it so closely to the human experience and Mm -hmm. they they make no bones but yes we see our gods as, of course, they're immortal, they're gods, you know, how else would you describe a god other than the main characteristics are they're they're immortal and they have powers. They are so humanistic, so so childlike. They're flawed, like humans, like they they have flaws like we have. They're jealous, they're petty to each other and to other, to humans. (laughs) 
they're in the, yeah. the greek gods are created in the image of man which is the reverse of the christian ideal that that man is in the image of god it's the it's the reverse they've created their gods to be this um image of of their own shortcomings yeah so it's just something about the innate relatability of right you're looking at these gods you're studying them and you're like that's something my mom could do that's something i could do that's something my sister could do mm -hmm. and it's just it hits in a way that's completely different because right. I think that it, while it's also wonderful, a lot of the Egyptian and Norse myths, <laughs> there's something that I definitely looked at more of as, oh, well, those are clearly just crazy stories that are really fun and amazing and have some lessons in there, but the, definitely thought is very much separate because mm -hmm. I, you can't really see yourself as much in what they're doing. I mean, everyone loves a good Osiris myth, but right. um, it's kind of like when you get to the, and then Seth cut his body into little pieces, 14 pieces to be exact, and spread them around each of them. Isis flies around and patches him together. And then they, you know, create Horus. And I'm like, okay, well then you lost me because yeah, Athena right. getting petty and turning some, a girl who weaves better to her into a spider. I can get that. I'm, I'm, you know, right. I'd like to think I'm not that petty, but I can understand that. What I don't understand is how you rip someone into 14 pieces, scatter their body parts around the, the country, and then patch them together through magic. That is not something I relate yeah. to. It's a fun story to, right. to tell you. And, and we do, and we do like these stories, but it, the difference, I, I mean, storytelling is all about structuring and organizing your world. And for most cultures, it's like the Egyptians. And so, so those, those myths help them understand why the world is the way it is and how things came to be. Um, and then the Greeks take it just one step further and in, impart this a human experience into it and reflect human emotions in a different you're absolutely right it's more relatable kind of sticking with this one of the things that i'm most interested in is classical reception but through modern media mm -hmm. because we tell these myths over and over and over again that's right and then you get things like the brad pitt troy dare i even say that Ooh. <laughs> yeah um and then you get other other newer adaptations as well like the new netflix troy fall of the city are there any particular movies tv shows books even any kind of popular culture that you think has particularly done well in taking the ancient material and, and bringing it to life for a modern audience? So, so to go back to this big myth class that I teach, one of the other assignments in this class is that they have to do a very short paper analyzing the narrative structure of a modern movie or book or, or graphic novel, whatever. It just has to be something modern. What I want them to see is that the way in which we tell stories, a lot of it is still very much indebted to the structure of Greek stories. So for example, um, so I, I specifically say they are not allowed to use Troy <laughs> or, or the 300. It, or it's not about those literal retellings of it in a modern way with, although there's those adaptations, there's adaptations like, like you said, Troy, really, truly, totally tinkers with the story to come up with a very different kind of outcome. What I really want them to is that these formulae that the Greeks, the, the journey of the hero, uh, fill in the blank, Heracles, Perseus, uh, Jason, you just fill in the blank. You can find that everywhere in our modern movies. So I think for me, in terms of reception, I think the best example of ancient reception in some ways is Harry Potter, is the Harry Potter sequence. Because Harry is the quintessential Greek hero. He overcomes adversity as a child. He uh, is semi-divine in a, in a way. He has to leave home and overcome challenges, face death, live. <laughs> And then he becomes immortal, not literally, I mean, Heracles becomes literally immortal, but our other heroes are immortal through Kleos, through their fame. And so Harry has all of these things. He can't do it alone. He has sidekicks, just like Heracles has his buddy Eolus. So this is, so, so I ask the students, I challenge them to find, in terms of reception, to find this kind of deeper level of narrative structure. Stories like love stories, Cupid and Psyche, the idea of having an unknown lover that you then are, you have to do these challenges in order to prove yourself. These kinds of stories are still present um, 
um, Theseus, uh, the uh, Theseus and the Minotaur is is the Hunger Games. The Hunger Games is, has the very same formula. They even call it tribute. The idea that the in the ancient times a tribute, the, there were fourteen seven boys, seven girls of Athens had to be taken to Crete. To, as tribute to Minos, and then they were fed to the Minotaur. Suzanne Collins very consciously took those, but but I think it's more rewarding to find it in unexpected places like Harry Potter. <laughs> That's so funny that you mentioned that because Harry Potter, oh, I have such a long journey with it. So I, one, have a really good friend who's a professor here in Chicago at DePaul, and she, she's not a classicist, but she teaches a Harry Potter course called Harry Potter and the Hero's Journey because she, oh. they use uh, Joseph Campbell's yes. uh, work and, mm -hmm. and they kind of analyze the whole thing about his, his journey. Of course, then there are the, the very surface level references that if you're a classicist, right. you'll recognize it from, from the names. Right. To Kerberos. The... Kerberos is fluffy. <laughs> exactly. So you'll you'll see these things. And once once people figure out that J.K. Rowling herself was a classics major at right. the University of Edinburgh, then they go, ah, it makes sense. Right. But I guess there are certain things that I miss that I continually either I'm going back for when people tell me, well, why do you reread that once every two years or something? Or why do you watch the movies again and again? And I'm like, well, because there's so many things laid on in there that I just miss. And one of the things actually that you just mentioned that I don't know why I didn't realize it before, but it just shocked me to the realization that, yeah, if we're talking about Harry is the quintessential greek hero one of the staples of greek mythology though is the the magical number three right it's it's there's three fates three furies you only want three heroes or one hero and, and two sidekicks on a quest oh my gosh wait there's three of them right. harry ron and hermione it's yes they have the other side characters but right they'll they'll sort of help in in certain situations but otherwise it's the three of them I did not even put together that it's using the mythological three in three rule. And the tri oh. wizard, the tri wizard challenge. My mind is blown completely. Can I take your myth class? That's that's all that's oh. all I've got. Cause now I'm like, I think it would spur me to to think of so much more and open my brain. Also, that assignment sounds fabulous. I wish, I wish that someone asked me modern <laughs> material to do that. Well, we also do we also do a mythology today segment, which this um, I tried different like Twitter doing it on Twitter, but this year it was just um, on our Canvas website because what our class site. But we asked them to look for the use of ancient things in modern logos, and and of course my two favorite, of course, are Pandora jewelry. Come on, their their tagline is um, uh, so it's like unforgettable memories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's pretty unforgettable when you open the box and all the, the sorrows come out. Um, and then the other one, of course, is Trojan condoms. It's like, come on, someone was asleep during myth class because first of all, the Trojans lose. Second of all, how do they lose? Something penetrates their defenses and then all of these things come out of it <laughs> and destroy the place. It's like, this is not a good model for for um, a condom. So we get we try to get them to look for these connections. Um, and some of them are like Goodyear has the Hermes foot. So the idea of the fleet, the Maserati is, um, has Poseidon's trident and it's the idea of the horsepower and this connection between Poseidon and horses. Anyway, we try to get them to see those more literal things. But I think for for I mean the students who take this class they are not going on to be classics majors. They some of them may pick up a certificate. You know these are the sort of minor later later even than minors major minors and certificates. But but I want them to go away seeing the the debt and the connection to the path, to the the Greek and Roman mythology. So now that begs the question, is there some sort of modern logo or symbol or use or representation of an ancient anything? Do, do, does there, is there one that stands out to you that bothers you because it's not right? Oh, you know, you know, the one that, um, well, I'll tell you the one that we got. So students submit these, they submit them for extra credit. And the one that they, we got a lot that 
the two that we get a lot that don't have anything to do with ancient mythology, this is sort of the reverse of your question. The one is dove, dove um, uh, soap, which, which one might think is connected to Aphrodite. It is not. You know, the dove is one of Aphrodite's animals. It is not, um, and the beauty and all of that, that's just incidental. Dove is something soft and fluffy that Procter and Gamble or whoever chose. And the other one is trident. Trident gum has nothing to do with Poseidon. <laughs> so so it, it's dent and teeth. The, the, it has nothing to do with Poseidon. It just sounds good. So those are the ones that um, they, that, that when, when they come up. The other one that, um, I like, but I have a kind of uncomfortable relationship with is the Versace, the Versace logo with Medusa. And I, I think it just, it just strikes me as something arrogant about fashion, that fashion can be so powerful that it turns people to stone, which I, I, I get the connection, but at the same time, I think that that level of arrogance just takes it, takes it a little too far. It worked, it worked for Versace though. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I can't, well, every time I see a Versace bottle, I'm just like, oh, it's Medusa's face on it. Yes, it's very bold. <laughs> it is very, it's a very bold statement. That's so funny. I, okay, so the, I would say these are the two that, that I personally always just, I'm like, oh, why? Uh, and, and you can tell me, feel free, please actually tell me whether this is something that comes up in your classes or if it's something that nobody talks about, but one of them is the use of the caduceus on all of our yeah. medical symbols. Yeah, we talk about that. When I do Hermes, I explain how this, this also was somebody who wasn't paying attention in mythology class and it went off the rails. Yes. So, so I, and I say, now you can impress your friends in pre-med <laughs> because you know the secret. Yeah, and you can say, well, if we were being accurate here this would be the rod of asclepius which right. i mean it i you know i get I it get it, it looks very similar it's the only difference really is one when, is like a stick with one snake one stake versus two yes right so i'm like okay i can understand but also if i just think about the hilarity of the symbolism though I the know. fact that we're using a hermes symbol and i'm like but but he ferries the dead to the underworld what message is this sending if you're sending putting people in an ambulance i'm like just to me the the, the hilarity is i'm like you're putting someone in a box where <laughs> if you're looking at the symbol it's like all right here we're putting them with hermes and he's going to take you to the underworld which is not where you want to go you want to live you don't want to go to the underworld yet not to mention that Hermes is also also the god of commerce. So the doctors who are aiming to make money instead of taking care of you. I think there are lots of um, mistakes here that are quite humorous. So that one sticks out to me. And then the other one is, and and you probably, I don't talk about this one pretty often as someone who, who likes vases especially, Pandora's box. It wasn't a box. It wasn't a box. It was a jar. Mm -hmm. Jar. And yep. it, was, it, it was, it was a, it's a, a pithos, right? A pit, well, yeah. A pithos, a storage jar. Mm -hmm. So yeah. when people talk about, oh, it's a Pandora's box or something, I always kind of make a face and go, <clears throat> Pandora's <laughs> pithos over here. And and, uh, and, then... and that explains how hope gets caught in the jar because the jar will have a narrow neck and a shoulder. So she can't get up in, out, she gets stuck on the shoulder. A box, it's hard to explain how hope gets stuck in a box. Yeah, and that comes down to the, the retelling of it, which is when I try to tell people about, you know, it's it's symbolic because hope one gets stuck and then there's also that modern sort of way of thinking about it in terms of well from a modern perspective when it comes to hope being the last one there well because she's there so you mm. need to give her permission to go away right mm -hmm. so it's this very mythological way of saying well you never abandon or hope never abandons you, you there's never not hope unless you actively right. make the choice to give up hope mm -hmm. which i i love that modern connotation but then i'm also like forever trying to explain well i mean she tried to leave she just yeah 
couldn't That's get out true. of the jar but <laughs> but you raised but this is a good example of one of the one of the other things that makes makes myth good to think with is like even in antiquity these things were ambiguous they they debated even in antiquity they, they debated what that meant or or um they they debated whether whether oedipus really committed a crime. I mean, this, these were things that they were ambiguous and meant to be ambiguous and meant to stimulate thought and discussion. Um, so that's something that drives students mad because they want to know which is the right answer, <laughs> which is, <laughs> they want to know, well, wait a minute, there are two birth stories for Aphrodite, which one is right? And, and, and that's, that's the beauty of this way of thinking is that it frees you. It's a, it's a much more um, non-linear kind of thinking, which I think is also really good for uh, many students who are really on kind of a job track training for college instead of a um, mind enhancing track for, which I wish more people would embrace their, their college experiences for that kind of growth. But regrettably, many universities like mine at the undergraduate level is really about career uh, and job training. So myth really is an outlier in many ways. Yeah, it, myth classes are always very different, even mm -hmm. the ones that uh, my alma mater, I went to Mizzou and oh, right. they, they put so much emphasis onto their big myth class because that's the only classics course that will get like 400 kids right. in it and all the other upper levels you get maybe 30 if you're mm -hmm. lucky the department was small and mm -hmm. I wish that we had the infrastructure in place so these departments could be bigger and you could have a lot more people but that again then just hits on the perpetual issue of well no one thinks the humanities will that's help right. you in the modern world so why mm -hmm. should we fund that I mean that's kind of stupid ha 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 right Right, right. Like you said before, exercising the muscle. I mean, this is like, I mean, this is this is the thing about the ancient gymnasium, right? The ex ancient gymnasium was a place where you exercise the physical muscles, but also your brain. And, and gymnasio, it continues to be what they call high schools in some countries, the gymnasio. And I think this idea that one needs to exercise your brain. And, and that was the difference between my biology classes and my chemistry classes. That was, I was using my brain, but in a very restricted way. It's this way of, of grappling with unknowns and ambiguity. That's using your brain in a different way and, and creating a sense of an ability to evaluate discrepant information, which is what our world is. Our world is full of discrepant inf information, ambiguity. So the more we can get students to wrestle with these uncertainties, there is no right answer, or these creative questions, which ask you to hypothetically think about things, that is a kind of brain exercise that I don't, that I think that's going to serve many students well, no matter where they end up. And then honestly, I know when we're not creating classics majors, I want to create a group of people who are classics friendly, that they uh, recognize what we do as valuable. And, you know, in the best of circumstances, I'd love to see double majors where we have somebody who's a biology and classics major in order to show that these are actually complementary and not exclusive in, in many ways. That is music to my ear because I always tell people it's okay if you don't want to go in academia. I didn't really want to do that myself, but it doesn't mean that classics is some old archaic thing that then you just should not do and abandon if you can't immediately look at it and see monetary value coming out That's of it. Right. That's right. And the trans, the so-called transferable skills, which we are so emphasizing, our, our universities are pushing us to emphasize transferable skills. They are what they call soft skills. But those soft skills are relevant to everything you do, everything you do. And everyone will have to articulate an argument and uh, analyze information. This is just, you do this when you go to the grocery store, you do this. <laughs> so, so it, and, and every job will have this regardless of what you're doing, whether you're, you're doing political work or whether you are um, supervising nurses at a hospital. It's, these are things that need to be developed more innately. And I think classes, classics classes give that opportunity because of the 
ambiguity. And I think you can find things, I mean, you can find a, a way to practically apply classics in even the most remote of places. I mean, there yeah. are these very natural careers that you can see the connection right away. Law, for one. Sure. Oh, we developed our systems based off of the ancient law systems and these ancient civilizations. Also, let's be real. There's a shit ton of Latin in yeah. in the law. Right. Um, and also in medicine. So it makes sense that you would see that and go, oh, well, this would be very handy maybe to learn some Latin. So I know what I'm talking about mm -hmm. since we have all these expressions. But I've been noticing the the modern trend where this can go, where a lot of people I think is is this is one of the keys to the future and in, in, in making a good argument that we need to grow together because STEM should be STEAM. Yeah. Put the mm -hmm. A for arts mm -hmm. in there is the video game industry. People would never look at video games and say, what do you mean you can employ a bunch of historians? No, 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 that's mm -hmm. not a thing. Yes, it is. I don't know if you've seen how many people were employed by Ubisoft when making uh, yeah. Assassin's Creed games. Right. They employed so many people. They had Egyptologists for the Egypt one. They had classicists for the Greece one. And they, they had a crap ton of like Viking age scholars for the new one. <laughs> it's beyond that though, right? I mean, if you are thinking about basic video game developing skills, you can teach a classicist to code for sure. Right. You can right. learn. Right. How are you going to have an engaging game, mm -hmm. especially these days when we like to set games in the past because that's just mm -hmm. the fun thing where let's mm -hmm. let's put this in some ancient culture. What are you going to do without a good narrative team? Exactly. What are you going to do yeah. with a bunch of random people who can just code? Right. Okay. It's it's boring if you have a game where you run around and do nothing. Right, and and two things about that. First is like the whole the whole principle of a video game is is the quintessential Greek hero. You have challenges. You have to do something in order to do something. It's it, it is it is you know Jason and the Argonauts. It's it's exactly the same kind of thing. You go on adventure. You have to leave home in order to find yourself. Uh, understanding again that narrative core comes from the ancient myth. But also, yeah, you're right. This sort of this idea of the the creativity that comes from understanding or knowing the originals and sort of being able to model those, that's really fantastic. And it, it, it takes somebody who is familiar with them and, and has that creativity and recognizes how these the usable past, you can use this past and, and make it into the present. I did um I did a reaction video for Assassin's Creed, the Odyssey one about their reconstructions and then just last week John Camp the director of the Agora excavations also did one for Assassin's Creed Odyssey um looking and they took him they took him on a tour of the Agora this is the guy who directs the excavation excavations of the Agora and he talked about the different elements that they had reconstructed and I taught last year in the terrible um, spring semester of 2020, the curtailed spring semester of 2020, I was teaching a class called the Archaeology of Myth with a, a wonderful graduate student, Sarah Beal, who is a gamer. She had recorded walkthroughs of Delphi and the Agora, and we used them in class. We used them in our class because they were such accurate and helpful envisioning, uh, help, help the students envision what the ancient world really looked like. I, so I, I cannot even imagine, like you said, how many people were employed because you really, they needed to know what was going on. They did it, they, the most amazing research. So, okay, just a quick footnote about Assassin's Creed Odyssey. So some of this stuff blew my mind, how they got the data to create what they did. So, so in both the one I did and the one John Camp did, we looked at Stoa Puikile, the painted Stoa, which had these wooden paintings. The wooden paintings do not survive. We have an ancient description of them by Pausanias. There is a scholar who created reconstructions based on those descriptions using images from vases. That was his dissertation. They used his study to recreate it in the, in the video game. The, they, that was a deep dive into scholarship. But they didn't get the Parthenon sculptures right. 
I don't know what went wrong. I mean, this is like low hanging fruit. I don't know the story behind it. We wondered if there was something about the Ministry of Culture. I don't know. Metopes are from Olympia. They're not the Parthenon Metope. Anyway, I couldn't believe like the discrepancy between this really deep dive and then something that was glaringly wrong. You know, and that bothers me as well because I did latch on and I loved my Greek art and archaeology classes and my favorite professor of all time at Mizzou. That was her specialty, although she did um, votive figures from Corinth. That was her mm. big thing. Is this but, Sue Langdon? But, is this yes, Sue Langdon? it is. Yeah, it know, is so. Dr. Yeah. Langdon. I She's love her fantastic. so much. So I took many, many classes with her because all I wanted to do is I would essentially show up at her office every semester hello, how many classes are you teaching? Which ones are you teaching? Am I eligible to be in all of them? Ended up taking a lot with her and just soaking up all of all of her knowledge, which was just amazing. But I am an archeo gamer. So mm -hmm. I actually use the game to make educational videos for the classroom. Mm -hmm. So for people like yourself who want to use these yeah I, I make these videos I walk oh, through and I, I do research and I talk about them and, and then I say here if you want to use this go ahead so in making these I did a lot of research and also being a podcaster you know I I reached out to some people at Ubisoft to talk about it it turns out that things like the Parthenon getting all of the statuary wrong it's more of a time and budget thing which is it takes so many hours to recreate these that usually whatever they start with they will just use that as the template so uh, say okay what's a what's a famous temple just give me a temple and they'd be like oh uh, olympia i don't know right. why and then they'd say okay great so draw me or find me a picture of the temple of olympia so then they would take that and say all right well we don't have enough time to do this because we do have to get this game ready to release sorry so then they kind of take that, they scan that, and then they just kind of plug it into every I temple see. in the game mm -hmm. to save on time to have it ready. As a critical scholar, I'm like, well, couldn't you just take the Parthenon because it's the most recognizable building right. in all of Greece and then use that formula for everything right. else? But, you know, who knows how they ask for these things. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, unfortunately, just it was time and, and money issue. How funny. That's very, that, that, that makes sense. That makes some sense. Yeah. So that's luckily not anyone deliberately <laughs> neglecting it. It's just they they would love to have to have it all perfect and beautiful. Mm -hmm. But um, but no, it, it's 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 oddly interesting how much they got right in terms of like the small details. I think I walked around the Agora and I was looking at some of the the vases and the pottery that they used in the game. And I was like, wait, that's right. It's correct. You have your little like black figure here and your little red figure here it's perfect and and then you have the bigger flubs where you know you're walking around delphi and then you're like that's not even the right stuff on the temple i don't yeah it's it, nevertheless like you were absolutely right in terms of using it for helping students visualize it. i i could get stuck talking about the popular culture and archeo gaming stuff all day so i will try not to do that or else we'll be here for four hours at the end of each episode i ask if each guest will read shelley's version of ozymandias and after reading it just give us your quick thoughts on the meaning of this poem if it evokes anything particularly strong do you look at it as a very much a work of its time or do you see very valuable lessons that can still be applied from it i met a traveler from an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert near them on the sand have sunk a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive. Stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed, and on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, in despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Okay, so when I read this, I mean, I think I do, it does evoke, it does evoke to me Egypt. And I had been, I hadn't been to Egypt in many years. And I went in December 2019. And 
I think I love what I really like is um, round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. And I think as an archaeologist, this makes me think about the fact how fast the, the environment overtakes the built, the, hum, the human constructed environment. We can build things, but the, the, the environment, nature will take it over very quickly and no more so than in the desert where the sand and the wind is very, very rapidly covers things up. And so that reminds us of we're fighting time and when we think we've made something that's gonna stand forever, it's not going to stand forever. And this evokes in me that, that feeling when I read that, that the, 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 how the sands have taken it over. And I think that this is this also, we encountered the ancient world a lot of times we encounter, encounter it through ruins and that we have sometimes created images based on those ruins, ruins that are more about ourselves than they are about the past. And for, for the Greek world, that's the whiteness of the statues, which is really anachronistic. That's not how they, appeared and so here to this the scowl and the, this is something that is projecting on so th this reminds us too that the ancient world is something that we can find ourselves in in various different ways sometimes um, poetically like this other times more culturally we see ourselves in the past and um, it reminds us that the these things are created by humans and so they they have within them a spirit of that human time Ooh, I like that answer also because it's a very archaeological answer, and I feel like a lot of a lot of what I'm used to is is these very theoretical things that are very deep, but don't look so much into the actual wording of it and, and how it evokes this archaeological side of yeah, time does move very fast, and it, and it tends to cover up a lot of things. I do like that a lot. Oh, good. <laughs> now, as a as a surprise to nobody, background in politics, I read it very much as a political statement as well by Shelley on the ephemeral nature of political power, Absolutely. who was Ozymandias, but Ramesses II. And this man thought his empire would last forever because it was the greatest thing in the world. And well and divinely ordained. divinely ordained so much for that <laughs> exactly i mean we really wouldn't know anything about his civilization if not for archaeologists for one digging up his stuff because otherwise we wouldn't know that stuff existed mm -hmm. and if not for the little people i mean he had to commission a statue because right. nobody in the history of anybody would believe that this king all-powerful person made this thing himself seeing it as as this very political statement of time and how we perceive of it the last question that i love asking each guest is if you think about today's modern culture and society is there a modern sort of ozymandias what is something in our culture that we think is the greatest thing that two thousand years from now we could it could just be gone and we could be like, that was the funniest shit we tried because why did we think that was great? That's no. Social media. I think, I think we're going to look back on it and see how fatuous it really is. And, and that it was really representative of our time, our self-involvement, our narcissism, and that we think it's the we think it's the best ever because it's a personal expression which is great it's great it's needed right now but I wonder if in time we're going to look back on it and and see it in a very different light as empty as it, it, it not as meaningful and important as we think it is today yeah I think it's so valid and it's true I got into a really theoretical conversation the other day with somebody about the nature of the selfie. And I'm like, what is more indicative of our own narcissism than you're in yeah. front of something, anything, it could be nothing even. And you you have to make a face and put on a, a filter because, you, oh no. And I think, I think with time, I'm sure, I'm sure that kind of communication will continue. It's just that this particular mo moment, I don't know, who knows, maybe it'll get worse. It'll get worse, <laughs> but we shall see. <laughs> 
hopefully it doesn't because i mean you know that then will give fuel to the people who are over here screaming that ai will take over the world and we'll never be independent we're going to turn into the matrix or something (laughs) which oh no that's terrifying but the matrix also fits the greek hero model neo is also a greek hero who overcomes talent who who has to leave home in order to experience and overcome challenges that's right he has to be unplugged yes Yes. he has to be unplugged and the the whole man behind the mage i'm never gonna watch that movie the same way again thank you thank (laughs) you for that (laughs) it was it's been such a pleasure having you on and being able to to talk and and really get into a lot of these things this morning it's it's thank you for the invitation this has been a lot of fun thank you very much trireme transit is now departing ancient office hours next stop is Present Ponderings I met a traveler from an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command Tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them, and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. 